Hello, everybody. On this episode of the show, I take two listener questions. The first one is asking about how to go about letting your workplace know that you have transitioned and changed your name. So I provide a few different perspectives on that, some options and kind of some scripts that you can use for talking with people if you're ever in a situation like that. I also give some tips from the side of somebody who is receiving that information and how you can be respectful to the person who has changed their name. And in the second question, I talked to somebody who is having a hard time feeling anything. So we dive deep into what anhedonia means, some options for trying to get that feeling back, and why this person shouldn't worry too much about the symptom at this juncture. So settle in wherever you are, and let's jump into it. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff. I'm a clinical psychologist and a self-help author from Southern California. My goal is to make mental health content for real people, just like you. And in this show, I answer your questions or dive deep into topics related to life, psychology, mental health relationships, and more. Please be aware that sometimes I use some spicy language, and I also don't shy away from sensitive topics, but I will try to give you a content warning whenever it's relevant. So if all this sounds good to you, let's get started. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. Welcome to the show. I really, really appreciate you being here today. This is episode 382 of the podcast. And today I have two really good listener questions uh, from listeners like yourselves. If you would like to send me a question for the show, please head over to DuffTheSyke.com and use the contact form there. Or you can email me at DuffTheSyke at gmail.com or... This is a cool thing this week. I have added a voicemail line. So if you go to the website, there's a little button at the top that says, uh, ask a question. And if you click there, there is a widget where you can use your phone or your desktop or laptop. You click on that and you're able to send me a question of you actually asking something. Now, this is something that I'm trying out. Not sure if I'm going to get a lot of questions uh, from you guys, but I'm also going to be using that as a tool to, you know, allow other people to participate in the podcast as well. I'm gathering some responses from people for an upcoming episode. Um, but for you guys, if you would like to send in a question by voice instead of having me read your question on the air, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, please keep in mind, you know, I keep the questions anonymous, but whatever you share, including your voice there, I would be using it on the air. So, of course, just be aware of that. And for the SpeakPipe widget, it's up to 90 seconds, which is actually a pretty good amount of time when you actually try it out. Another thing that I have uh, adjusted on the website is the search bar. Guys, <laughs> the search bar is finally back. Holy crap. Um, a lot of you guys have asked where it went and how you can find old episodes and such. And this is just a really good lesson in trying things before assuming that they are difficult or they won't work. There's been a few things recently that I have um, sort of just challenged myself on to be like, okay, what assumptions am I making here? Am I talking myself out of trying something for no reason? And the search bar on the website was one of them. Um, we were under the impression that in the theme that's on my site because it's on WordPress, um, they didn't have the search bar option because if you try to add it in, it's like, hey, upgrade to this plane and you can add the search bar in. But really all I had to do was go into, you know, one of the settings for, you know, WordPress itself and click a box. And when I checked that box, suddenly there's a search bar there at the header. So if you would like to see if your question or your topic has been covered before on the podcast or elsewhere, like a blog post or something like that, just go to the search bar. It works really well for that. Um, you know, go to DuffTheSec.com, click the search bar, and you can put in something like, say, bipolar or relationships or exposure, whatever. And that will help you find all the episodes that are relevant to that topic. So that was one of those things that I've done recently. Another one is um, right now I'm recording on the microphone in question. And this microphone was uh, very saggy. <laughs> it uh, was sagging in its shock mount. Um, if you watch any of the videos that I post, you can see there's like a, a cage around the microphone. You've probably seen it before with professional mics that's held by rubber bands. Um, mine were so loose that the, the mic was just resting on metal, which is not what you want. And for some reason I had it in my mind that it was going to be very difficult to fix. It took 
all of two minutes. I have the band somewhere buried in my stuff because I bought them, you know, probably a year ago or more. And it took me all of two minutes to take them off, put it back on, and now it's fixed. So this is just your call to challenge yourself and don't assume that something is not going to work before you actually give it a shot or look into it. So all of that preamble aside, let's go ahead and get into the first question. Um, yeah, here we go. It reads, hello. That's verbatim, H-E-L-L-O-O-O-O-O. Hello, I've recently gone through the process of legally changing my name. I've been using this name everywhere apart from work for around 10 years, and the anxiety surrounding coming out is what's kept me from changing it legally for so long. Do you have any advice on how to tell people I've changed my name? I've worked in the same place for seven years, so I know it will take some getting used to on their part. But also, 90% of my colleagues are of the age where this isn't widely accepted. Any advice would be appreciated. Um, thank you for the question. First off, congratulations on legally changing your name. Uh, I know for a lot of people that is a huge step. So if that's the case for you, congratulations. And I'm not totally sure what the context here is because this is, you know, the entire message that, that I got. I read it out loud, but it sounds like maybe potentially you are transgender or non-binary and you haven't come out at work, even though you have in other places. It could be that there's something else going on here. Of course, people change their name for other reasons, like they just decide to, or they don't feel connected to their family, or they got a divorce or something like that. But, you know, when you said that 90% of your colleagues are of the age where this isn't widely accepted, I'm guessing that means that there's something more like the first situation where we're looking at, you know, a gender transition of some kind. Uh, I'm going to roll with that. I apologize if this is totally off base, but I think this gives me the best platform to talk about these sort of issues. So that's going to be my assumption here. Um, and given that, I'm also going to mention that I am approaching this question as an outsider. I am a cisgender man, meaning my um, gender identity matches the sex that I was assigned at birth, and I have never changed my name. Um, I'm sure that there are some amazing content creators. I'm certain that there are um, out there on social media or YouTube that have tips from a more personal perspective that can actually, you know, give you the perspective of lived experience. So please be sure to gather other influences as well. You know, what I'm saying, I will do my best to give you some thoughts and things that are helpful, but I'm coming from a limited perspective. Now, before answering the question itself, I want to give some context for people that might not fully understand the situation and exactly everything we're talking about. So if the person here asking the question is transgender, as I'm assuming, that means that they were assigned a certain sex at birth, basically based on how they look, how they present as, you know, a baby. And then as they developed, they came to realize that that sex that was assigned to them at birth doesn't line up with their internal sense of their own gender. So for example, maybe they were born and the doctors looked at them and the doctors and their parents said, oh, hey, that's a female, that's a girl. But as they developed their own sense of self and you know went to school, did the things that normal kids do, it became apparent to them that, no, I'm not actually a woman. So gender identity is somebody's internal sense. That's, that's what you feel like you are. That is your identity. That's different from gender expression, which is how you may choose or choose not to show your gender outwardly. This has things to do with, um, you know, how you dress, what you do with yourself. Um, and neither of these have anything to do with the actual physical primary or secondary sexual characteristics that develop. Um, so these are some of the terms here. There are many different ways to identify, uh, but one other one to bring up aside from transgender would, would be uh, non-binary. And this is sort of an umbrella term that acknowledges that um, our typical binary of man and woman don't fit that person's experience. Um, there are a lot of reasons why somebody might, you know, identify as non-binary. Uh, it's, it's not all one thing, but that's another possibility here. And a lot of people who are non-binary do go on and change their names because it fits better for them. So for the person asking this question, you know, it seems like, you know, their awareness that they're trans or non-binary is not new. That's not something that they're just realizing now. They said they've been using the name that they legally changed to for around 10 years already. So that's their name. This is not a question, right? That is their name. The question is, how are they going to approach the logistical aspect of this? And how are they going to balance the fear of potential negative reactions or other things within that realm when you know, um, they want to try to be themselves. One other term to throw out before getting into the question is uh, dead name. 
So dead name. That's the term that you would use to refer to the name that somebody was assigned previously. And they don't use that anymore because it doesn't fit with their identity. Typically, it is the most respectful thing to do to avoid using somebody's dead name because one, it's simply not who they are. That is not their name. And two, it may also have some hard feelings attached to it. And in some cases, trauma, right? It's very hard growing up and being transgender or, you know, gender non-conforming, non-binary, because, you know, our society has made some strides in certain ways, but it's not easy. And so some people have a lot of trauma or just really difficult feelings attached to their dead name, and they don't want to hear it because it feels invalidating. We all make mistakes, right? And if you have somebody in your life that has come out as trans or non-binary, you may accidentally use their dead name or even sometimes maybe misgender them at times, meaning use the wrong pronouns for them. Um, and that's, you know, possibly because you're still retraining yourself. You're still getting used to using these pronouns and the ways of addressing the person that are different from the way that you have for years already. Ideally, you want to strive to use the correct name and gender for this person the vast majority of the time, right? Try to do that work. Try to be careful about it. But if you accidentally slip up, which can totally happen, the most important thing to do is just acknowledge it and apologize, right? It may seem like a small mistake to you, like what's the big deal, but you're going to want to communicate to the other person that they're valid in wanting to be addressed correctly. So a quick apology and a correction goes a long way right? But unfortunately, not everybody has that kind of care. Not everybody, you know, is willing to do that. And there are people out there who think that the person asking this question, that their existence is not valid. There are people out there who will never make an effort to address them correctly. And there are people out there who are outright mean or want to be harmful toward them because they're trans or non-binary. So it's totally reasonable for the person asking this question to feel hesitant and unsure about coming out in an environment where, you know, they've been addressed and possibly perceived a certain way for many years. So to the person asking this question, um, I'm glad that you're being realistic with yourself, that there may be some people that don't get it and are not graceful in how they will hand it, handle it. It's definitely a possibility, right? But I think that it's also worth it to try to give people a chance to be decent, to see what happens. Either way, it's going to be a transition, and that will involve correcting people, potentially, and teaching people how to address you correctly. There may be some hiccups, but it may also be a smoother experience than you expect. I have heard both sides of the coin. On the logistical side for your work, the first thing that I would have you do is um, figure out if your organization that you work for has a dedicated HR department, so human resources. And if the terms are different internationally, I'm not sure. Basically, HR is the department that handles um, hiring and firing and dealing with conflicts and things related to just personnel in the workplace. Um, I asked for some feedback from my audience about this, and a, a personal friend of mine shared the process at her organization. Now, her organization is, you know, explicitly LGBTQ plus friendly, um, but what they do is when an employee notifies HR about a name change or a change in pronouns, the manager will work with the individual and other leadership to figure out what is their comfort level, how do they want to handle the situation moving forward. So it's not just a blanket. Um, thing that they do, it is a back and forth process and an individualized process. And in some cases, the person um, may be able to send out like a blast email to the whole organization, or at least their kind of region, their team, reintroducing themselves. And in other situations, HR may reach out and disseminate that information on their part, kind of more officially. Um, likewise, if there's a problematic situation or the person is encountering negative interactions, um, they can, you know, talk with the people or do any sort of disciplinary action that's necessary because it's brought, been brought to their attention and they have that sort of initial talk on file and on record so that can really help with that resolution process. Um, in my personal and my professional life, I've worked with a number of people and I know a number of people that have gone through similar transitions. And most often I've seen people make some sort of announcement on their own. That can be an email to their organization. It could be a quick speech before say like a team practice for a sport or something like that. Or if you have a weekly huddle for your team, uh, it can look a lot of different ways, but most often people like having some degree of a hand in it. 
And it's for you to decide how detailed you would like to be with this, uh, to what extent you may want to welcome questions or dialogue from other people. You know, you don't need to be the educator for everybody, but it can be helpful to recognize when people are coming from a place of ignorance rather than malice, right? You don't have to be okay with either of them, but you may want to treat your response differently. Um, so we'll get into how you can respond to people and how you can tell people about how you change your name, but I want to take a quick break and talk about our first sponsor today. All right, this episode is brought to you by Chomps. I have something to confess to you all. I am a snacker. <laughs> there, I said it. I'm a big snacker. If there are salty or sweet things in the house, there's a good chance that I'm going to blast through them mindlessly when everybody else is in bed or as I'm passing by the kitchen during the day. And one thing that I found very helpful is to have better choices to snack on. And that's where Chomps comes in. Chomps is making snacking simple. They make tasty meat sticks that are packed with up to 12 grams of protein per stick. They have no unhealthy additives and zero grams of sugar. You can read the ingredient list right on each stick and see how simple they really are. Chomps sources their meat from farmers that focus on humane and responsible practices. And they come in nine flavors, which taste really, really good. I'm a huge fan of the taco flavor. I got a big box of those and just burned through the whole thing. And I've also enjoyed their more simpler flavors as well. They have different varieties of meat that you can check out if you'd like. They gave me a big pack to try out, and I actually finished the last one earlier this week, which I'm super sad about. So Chomps, if you're listening, please send more. <laughs> So if you're looking for a satisfying snack that fits with your lifestyle, check out Chomps and get 20% off your first order with free shipping at chomps.com slash duff. That's chomps, C-H-O-M-P-S dot com slash duff. Don't forget to use that link so we know who sent you. Okay, so getting back into it here, um, in regards to how you might tell people that you've changed your name, you could simply say something like, oh, hey, you know, let me pause you for a sec. Maybe you've seen the email about this already, but I actually changed my name. Um, I go by Aaron now. So if you could please address me as Aaron, I would really, really appreciate it. I don't use that other name anymore, right? Aaron's obviously an arbitrary name, but um, that's one way that you could do it. And if they ask why, like, oh, well, why'd you do that? You can decide if you want to keep that to yourself or if you want to fill them in. Um, you could say, well, you know, although I haven't talked a lot about it at work yet, um, I'm actually a transgender man for example, and I've finally taken that leap to legally change my name. Or you could say something like, um, this is actually the name that I've been using for some time. I just have now finally taken that leap and legally changed it. Or you could even be more private and say, you know, I don't want to get into too many personal details because this is work, but just be aware that's my official name now. I don't use the other name anymore. So it would mean a lot to me if you didn't use that name and instead you called me Aaron because that is my legal name, right? You can choose whatever, you know, level of in you want to give the person. And it doesn't have to be the same for everybody, right? It doesn't have to be the same for everyone. Some people, you know, if you have closer people in your organization, you might give them the whole scoop. You might give them more information. And for other people, you might keep them a little bit more at arm's length or, you know, make wise choices to keep yourself safe if you know there's going to be potentially some conflict there. But regardless, it might be helpful for you to think about a few sort of canned responses, some responses that you can have ready to go when people ask you about this and to pull it out in various situations. I would say one of the best things that you can do for your anxiety about this is try not to oversolve situations before they even present themselves. I know that's a tall order. That's what anxiety wants you to do. But, um, you know, if you find that many people are willing to use your name, but they seem kind of clueless about your circumstances, then maybe you can put together some links or resources to direct them toward. But you don't need to do that ahead of time, right? That's just one example, right? Like maybe in your mind, you need to come up with the perfect explanation. You need to come up with the perfect list of resources that you've vetted and everything like that. And you need to think of what you could say to each individual person when they confront you about this, because obviously in your mind, it's going to be a confrontation. No, right? You can let it happen, see where it goes. And if you feel the need to do that, then you can gather some of those resources and direct them toward places that they can learn more or explain it to them, right? You don't need to do that ahead of time. And obviously the education part, that was just one arbitrary example. It could be anything. It could be talking about boundaries. It could be saying, you know, you don't have the right to ask me this. Please don't do it again. Whatever is appropriate for you. 
Um, you don't need to plan all that ahead of time. You just need to recognize that you have options. You don't have to say the same thing to everybody. And if something doesn't go the way that you want or that you are expecting, you can adapt to that. Um, if people are mean or exclusionary or abusive toward you, you may want to talk with HR and address it. But again, you don't need to figure that out even before it happens. Um, you're aware of the possibilities. You know that you have options no matter what. You don't need to let your mind spin forever and ever on hypotheticals. In the end, this is work, right? Work is about work. You don't need to have them approve of your decision to change your name, right? Their opinion about your gender or your presentation doesn't matter. And if they can't separate those things, that's on them. You haven't done anything wrong by being yourself. So I want to encourage you to stay true to your identity and to your boundaries. You are totally allowed to insist that people address you correctly. You know, from where I stand, this is no different from somebody that has a name that's hard to pronounce, maybe a name that isn't, you know, what we tend to hear in America. They are well within their rights to insist that people make that minimal effort to just simply pronounce their name correctly. And same thing here. It's who you are. You are valid. At the same time, this is entirely personal, right? So if you don't care enough, I know some people that are, you know, transgender or non-binary and they couldn't give a shit about what people call them. They know what they call themselves. They know who they are, but they're not going to spend the time and the effort correcting somebody else, right? But other people really do. <laughs> so if you don't care about your coworkers enough to correct them every time when they get it wrong, that's fine. As long as you aren't gaslighting yourself about it, right? As long as you aren't saying, oh, well, it's fine. I know it's kind of hard. It's you know, maybe it's my fault for not talking about it enough beforehand or whatever. No, right? You are who you are and that's okay. You just do what you feel comfortable with and what feels right to you. And that's allowed to change over time. So thank you for the really, really good question. I'm very proud of you for taking the step and good luck. Okay. And before we get into the second question, let's go ahead and talk about our other sponsor today. This episode is sponsored by Air Doctor. Americans, being as awesome as we are, spend on average 90% of our time indoors. I know that sounds like a lot, maybe a bit dramatic, but if you think about it and track every moment of your typical day, you might change your mind about that. We do spend a great deal of time indoors. And unfortunately, according to the EPA, indoor air can be two to five times more polluted than outdoor air. Given that we take around 20,000 breaths per day, that is a lot of potential exposure to airborne allergens like dust mites, mold, pollen, or if you're like me, pet dander. So what's the solution? Air Doctor makes air purifiers that have been shown in independent lab testing to remove 99.99% of bacteria and viruses tested. The average size of pollen is about 25 microns, and Air Doctor removes nearly 100% of particles as small as 0.003 microns in size. And it's powerful enough to circulate the air in a 630 square foot room four times per hour. Air Doctor comes with a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. So head over to airdoctorpro.com and use the promo code DUFF, D-U-F-F. Depending on the model, you can get up to 40% off your purchase. So lock in that special offer by heading to Air Doctor, A-I-R-D-O-C-T-O-R, all spelled out, airdoctor.com and use the code DUFF. All right, and on to the second question. It reads, hey, Dr. Duff, you probably read this a lot, but thank you for doing what you do. The knowledge you've shared on your podcast has been immensely helpful to me at the rough and also the good times. You're very welcome. Uh, now to my question. I've noticed recently, the past two to three weeks, that I don't really feel any emotions anymore. Like, for example, I submitted my bachelor's thesis today and had absolutely no response, no feelings of relief or happiness that it's over. But it's not just big things. Small moments that used to make me feel happy, like walking my roommate's dog or baking and cooking, evoke no emotion in me. It doesn't matter if I'm being let down by a friend or having really negative thoughts, I won't actually feel sad or angry. This scares the shit out of me. How can I get my brain to connect to me again and feel emotions? I do have a history of depression, but this feels different, and I don't think it's worth seeking professional help for. How can I help myself? Are there techniques or mindfulness activities that aren't bullshit to learn to start feeling emotions again, or will this just regulate itself? Uh, thank you for the question. This is a very good one, very interesting, and I'm sorry that you're having such a scare with this. Uh, I know it's kind of frustrating, a little scary for you, so I hope I can give you some helpful thoughts. Um, I also want to say congrats on submitting your bachelor's thesis. Even if you aren't feeling very connected to the emotion of that achievement, it's still an achievement, and I think you still deserve to be commended. So, you know, clap for you. That's a big deal as far as I'm concerned. 
Um, but what you're dealing with, it sounds like a symptom that I have talked about on the podcast before. It's something that's called anhedonia, A-N-H-E-D-O-N-I-A, anhedonia. And anhedonia literally is just the Greek word for inability to feel pleasure. And that's basically what it is. It's the experience of diminished or weakened emotional responses. And this can definitely be in regards to things that would otherwise be pleasurable, like you mentioned. So walking your roommate's dog or baking, engaging in hobbies. But it can also be a lack of feeling for other things as well, like not feeling much when you get a job that you applied for or feeling no pang of sympathy when you see something really sad on the news on television. So just lack of feelings in general. That sounds very much like what you're dealing with, um, but I do want to mention another symptom that could be potentially at, at play here or with other people that are saying, okay, this sounds familiar. There's another thing to be aware of, which is uh, dissociation. So recently on episode 377 of the show, if you go to duffthepsych.com slash episode 377, I talked all about depersonalization and derealization. And these experiences, they can often lead to feeling not much of anything, right? It can feel blunted. It can feel like you're disconnected from your emotions. But the one thing to help tell the difference between dissociation and anhedonia is usually that you have other feelings, other sensations of disconnection, like you feel like you're disconnected from reality, or you're not really in control of your life, that you're just sort of on autopilot or watching it from afar. These are all dissociation symptoms. So, you know, you would know which of those fits more like, you know, with your situation. But um, yeah, I, this sounds very much like anhedonia from what you're describing. Now, it's very interesting that you feel like your lack of feelings has come on within the past few weeks, and it sounds like something you haven't exactly experienced before. So the first thing that I would be looking at in this case, if I were, say, treating you or, you know, having a long conversation with you is what's been going on over the past few weeks, right? That's the first thing I would want to know. Have you been going through an extremely stressful time? Have you had something bad happen to you or a loved one? In other words, is there some sort of identifiable threat that your mind is protecting you from by disconnecting or going numb? It's hard to say what this might be without being able to talk to you at length and get to know you, but um, I have seen people that feel anhedonia or dissociation because they have difficult emotions under the surface, and they have no way of understanding or dealing with them, or at some level they know they're not in a place where they can cope with them. Um, I've seen people that have been through trauma and find themselves numb because they simply can't open that box and just let the floodgates open and everything come in. I've also seen people who have to put their blinders on to get through really stressful circumstances, right? Maybe they're going through a very hard time in their life and all they can do is look forward, put one foot in front of the other and just keep going. And then after that thing is over, it takes a little while to sort of come back to earth and come back to reality. So those are all different possibilities for why somebody might experience that symptom of anhedonia. You also mentioned that you have a history of depression. Anhedonia is a common symptom in depression. Now, this isn't something that you will find in, say, the DSM or another you know, clinical book. But in my experience, I think that anhedonia tends to present more with the flavor of depression that makes you feel like physiologically depressed, you know, unmotivated, lethargic, things of that sort rather than the type of depression that makes you feel sorrowful and helpless and crying a lot, right? They aren't, they're not mutually exclusive, but in general, I, I think people kind of tend to lean more toward one or the other. And anhedonia is definitely more common in that sort of low, slow, sluggish sort of depression. Now, there's definitely a possibility here that you're just experiencing your depression in a different way. But I think it's something that you could talk to your providers about. Right? You mentioned that you don't feel like it's worth seeking professional help. I'm not sure that I agree with that. Um, it sounds like the experience is confusing and startling to you overall. So some outside perspective with somebody that's educated, understands a symptom, and can help you walk through it could be very valuable. Um, if it turns out that depression or you know underlying big scary emotions are the source of this disconnection, it would absolutely be something that a therapist could help you recognize and navigate. And they may also be able to help you learn the tools you need to start feeling again. Uh, a few examples. So one, maybe you would be working on better recognizing your emotions that are there, even if they seem faint, 
And there's a variety of ways to do this. Um, I've talked about the the feelings wheel before. If you just Google, you know, feelings wheel or emotions wheel, it's just a tool that helps you kind of zero in on what exactly you're feeling if you don't have the vocabulary for it right now. Um, it might also involve doing body scanning, right? So sitting there focusing on how you feel in your body, the different sensations that are happening and kind of developing a better awareness and recognizing the physiological changes that map to those emotions. And these are all exercises that do have their roots in mindfulness, being present, being aware, sticking with the moment and feeling it out rather than abandoning ship. And I would say these are definitely not bullshit activities, but they're things that you can do to develop your awareness and sort of through a back channel, remind yourself what these emotions feel like, even if you've kind of lost sight of it right now. With a therapist, you might also work on what's called behavioral activation. And this is essentially when you try to teach your brain to feel pleasure again. Uh, I include some really good tips and exercises for this in my depression book. It's a hardcore self-help fuck depression. You can find it on Amazon website, link in bio, all of those things. Um, but essentially what you do is you are continuously engaging in activities that would typically be pleasurable for you. And you keep force feeding yourself those activities. You keep doing it like a job, even if you don't really feel anything from it until you start to feel things again, because your brain will open up and it will start kind of retraining itself to feel pleasure and feel reward again. It's a chemical thing. It's a, it's a neurotransmitter thing, and it can be difficult during that sort of ramp up process, but it is an effective strategy. And it's something that has been proven as a research backed approach. Um, another avenue for tap, tapping into emotions, aside from, you know, behavioral activation, body scans, and all of that would be art or creative expression. Um, things like painting or drawing, music, writing, shoot, even a physical activity, you know, something like dance or boxing or jujitsu or running, any of these things, they might bring about the emotion that's lurking under the surface and help you access it if the normal channels for accessing emotions just aren't serving you well. And aside from the mental health aspect, we would also want to take a look at other factors in your life, things like physical health, because there can absolutely be physical health changes that can make your emotions feel more blunted. This isn't to scare you. Like, I don't think that you have some dangerous, sinister medical issue going on here, but it would probably be a good idea to make sure that you get some blood work done. Maybe you look at things like your thyroid level and just monitor this change overall in your emotions with your doctor, because things like medication side effects or different hormonal issues, these can impact your perception of emotions. Also things like inadequate sleep, right? If you're getting chronically not enough sleep, that can definitely change the way that you experience the world and what you feel in terms of emotions. So there's a lot of aspects to consider here. It's more than we could tease apart in a podcast episode, but those are some ideas for you. Overall, I just want to express it is not an uncommon symptom but it totally can be disturbing. And I don't blame you for being concerned about it. There are a ton of different areas you could potentially follow up on. Maybe it's related to depression. Maybe it's a physical health change. Maybe it's the phase in your life and what you've been going through, high levels of stress, poor sleep, maybe other avenues that I haven't touched on here or all of them together to some degree. What I'd say is you don't need to tough it out alone. You don't need to go through it by yourself. I would highly encourage you to talk to your doctor maybe see a therapist. It doesn't have to be forever, right? Even if you saw a therapist for a couple months, just like, you know, four, six, eight sessions, and that got you back on track, that would be awesome. And then you could just say, hey, I figured that out. Next time it pops up, I know what to do. But yeah, I think it deserves some, you know, uh, a good look at it and some effort in trying to fix this and get back to where you are feeling happiness and sadness and everything in between. I don't think this will last forever. And I think there are ways to go about making it a bit better. So best of luck to you. I really hope this starts to resolve quickly for you. And thank you for the question. And that's the end of the episode, everybody. Um, if you want to send me a question for a future episode, please go to DuffTheSec.com. Use the contact form or the SpeakPipe widget. You can also send me an email to DuffTheSec at gmail.com. And the full show notes for this episode are at DuffTheSec.com slash episode 382. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode. If you would like to send a question or a topic for a future episode, please email me at deftthepsych at gmail.com. If you like my approach and would like to learn more about my books, online course, or other resources, please head over to my website at deftthepsych.com. 
And lastly, it would mean so much to me if you would leave a review for the podcast wherever you listen to it or share an episode with a friend. Until next time, you got this.